if you look here, this probably makes you think of something. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. And uh, probably that uh, rings a bell in some of your minds. And so what we're going to do is we're going to watch. You know, you know what I love? I love seeing the, the origin of a lot of these things. And some of, the, some of the greatest hymns or songs ever written were born out of these incredible tragedies and difficult times. And I think there's a huge lesson in that. I, you know, we've done the It Is Well with, your, with My Soul one. And uh, so we're going to run a video here that just shows the background to that song. So. Just brings a, a bunch more power. 
brings a bunch more power to the thing that um, you look and you see where this actually came from. Because, uh, you know, I think everybody always asks, because of course, you know, we've traveled for many years and we wrote a lot of songs and did a lot of things. But uh, people used to always ask me, you know, want to sit down and just write a song together or something. I said, I've never been able to do that. And, uh, and then people would also ask, why my songs actually seem so depressing? <laughs> so, you know, I have, uh, I have some that are not depressing, I think, but a lot of them were born out of just these very real struggles. That's when things kind of come, and I can't just sit down and write a song. Um, and if you look, most of these really, really great songs have come from uh, um, trial and struggle and battle and, and the things that you face that are hard. Um, so that, that story, that story is, is powerful, but it, there's so much in the song that, uh, that just brings out or brings alive some of the scriptures that uh, go along with it. That first verse, "'Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know, thus saith the Lord." And ask the question, what, what, what does it mean to actually trust in Jesus? What does it mean to take him at his word? You know, those, just, that, just that phrase right there, take him at his word, is a huge thing because we live in a time when there's so much information out there that works to kind of explain away what God has actually said. There's a lot of people preaching a lot of really wacky false doctrine, and there's a lot of stuff where people are just taking and putting what they want to be in the Bible in there, just all kinds of weird stuff. But what if, if God's people were simply to take him at his word? If we say we trust in Jesus, certainly we would take him at his word, Right? So what does it mean to really trust him? You know, on, on, on Wednesday nights, we've been uh, going through uh, Philippians. And that first chapter, of course, Paul is writing this. He's imprisoned. Um, he's going to be on trial before Nero. And if you know who the emperor Nero was, he was uh, a guy with a penchant for murdering Christians. And that was kind of his thing. And so Paul's sitting there waiting for this trial before the most powerful and the most evil guy um, that you could possibly going in front of. Now, weirdly enough, history kind of, it appears, we don't know for sure, but it appears that Paul was probably acquitted at that trial. But uh, the fact is, he's sitting there facing this and waiting for this moment when he surely thinks he's probably in trouble. It's probably over. Um, now, what does it mean then? What does it mean to, to trust in him? And if, in Philippians 1, 12 through 14, and I realize for those of you here Wednesday night, that's a little bit of a review, this first part. But it says, I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel, so that it has become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. And most of the brethren in the Lord, having become confident by, by my chains, are much more bold to speak the truth without fear. Now, what does this say about Paul's priorities? You know, honestly, what does it say about his priorities? He's sitting there in a horrible situation looking at death, and he's saying, you know what? Hey, guys, good news. This has turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. There's so many things that, that God can take that are wrong and they're bad, and God can take them and use them for his glory. And you look at even that video as we watched it, and you think, what a terrible tragedy. What a terrible thing to, for especially this young girl and, and of course, his wife to, to watch uh, the father and husband drown before their eyes. That's a, a horrible thing. But the result of that was they ended up missionaries in a place, and they ended up writing a song that's been powerful for a long, long time. God can take the tragedies in our life and the struggle and all that and make it into something glorious if we really trust in Jesus and if we really take him at his word. It says, you know, here's Paul completely wrongly imprisoned by a very corrupt system, very corrupt, and it's just horrible. There's, there isn't a lot of hope, and yet he's just pleased that it's turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. That's a, that's a kingdom mindset. That's trusting in Jesus. And a little further down in chapter 1, 19 through 26, it says this, for I know that this it will turn out for my deliverance through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but with all boldness as always, so now also Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit for my labor." Yet what shall I choose? I cannot tell, for I'm hard-pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. And being confident of this, I know that I shall remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy and faith, that your rejoicing for me may be more abundant in Jesus Christ by coming to you again. So he has this idea. He has this idea that he, he might be released, might be able to go there. 
<clears throat> but what's really interesting in this scripture, if you think about his mindset, is that personally, that wasn't his first choice. I mean, if you read that, his first choice is, I would prefer to depart and go with Christ. So do you think he's going to Nero with fear? No, you're not going to Nero with fear because actually his preference, his preference is that he would be martyred and go on to be with Jesus. But he says, you know, for you guys, it's better that I remain. And so I would rejoice in that. He says, I'm torn between the two. That's a strange mindset, isn't it? Strange mindset. To sit there and go, wow. So, so when he talks about deliverance, he says, I know it will turn out for my deliverance. At that point, he's saying, you know, I don't know for sure if he's going to kill me or if I'm going to be with Christ or if I'm not. But I know it will turn out for my deliverance. Well, because either way, guys, either way, it turns out for his deliverance. It does. It turns out for his deliverance. It's either his deliverance on to glory or his deliverance from that and back into you know, wandering around telling people about Jesus. So either way, it comes to that place that he really wants to be. That is trusting in Jesus. Because he wasn't up a preacher like me talking about some theoretical scenario, you know. He wasn't talking about, well, if I was in this situation, I might do this. He was in the situation. And so he's in that actual setting, that actual place where all of a sudden he's you know, most of us would be sitting there, you know, making a choice. And I don't know Paul's whole mindset through the whole course of this, except that it seems like he was pretty consistent right on through, going, you know what? To God be the glory. No matter what, to God be the glory. No matter what happens, to God be the glory. And I would just hope that in my life or in my death that he would be glorified. Either way. So that's deliverance. That's trusting in Jesus. That's taking him at his word. To live as Christ and to die is gain. A lot of people don't really believe that because they don't really take Jesus at his word. Because he said this. He said, I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, you might be also. There should be something very exciting about that if you're a believer. And he goes on, and now the second verse, she, she writes, Oh, how sweet to trust in Jesus, just to trust his cleansing blood and in simple faith to plunge me neath the healing, cleansing flood the cleansing flood of the blood that was shed for us on the cross by Jesus Christ that we might have forgiveness of sin and we might be freed from the penalty of sin and death. Through his sacrifice, the song and what Heather was talking about earlier, what we don't deserve, not only do we not deserve it, but there's nothing you'll ever be able to do to get yourself to the place where you do deserve it. It's not there. That, that goal is not attainable. But that goal is completely accomplished in Jesus Christ. And so we know we can trust in him, and that's where our, our entire hope, our entire hope should be in Jesus Christ. So it says just to trust his cleansing blood. And when it comes to trusting Jesus for our salvation, it means that we trust that he is fully sufficient for our salvation. He is complete. He has done it. He has done it. And the only question then is will we take him at his word? Will we take him at his word? Will we believe that, that he has done it? To trust in Jesus for your salvation means you are absolutely not trusting in anything else for your salvation. And since we're talking about taking him at his word, it is so sweet to trust in Jesus just to take him at his word. We're going to dig into a whole bunch of his scriptures here, and I'll roll through them, but I think you, you find it is just indisputable. It is just indisputable. Romans 3, 21 through 24 says, But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. For there is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 2, 4 through 8. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised us up together and made us sit in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Jesus Christ. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourself, it is the gift of God. Do you know what a gift is, guys? 
A gift is a gift. If, I, if you come to me and you say, I mean, even if that gift was disproportionate, if you said, hey, can you come, uh, you know, uh, slap this window in my house, the hole's already prepared, all you got to do is screw it in there. And I went over and did that, and then you paid me $5 million. <laughs> that would seem disproportionate to the job, but it still would not be a gift. It still would not be a gift. It would be paying me for doing the window, paying me in a ridiculous amount to do a window. <laughs> and for that price, I'll do your windows. <laughs> Five million each. That's what I got. That's my price. Um, but I mean, honestly, if you think about that, we look at that and that's completely disproportionate, but it still is not a gift. It's not a gift if we are doing something in return for that. It's just payment. It's reward. This is, this is our inheritance. Our inheritance is heaven. The reward, that's all a little bit trickier to, to go down, but he says there are rewards for obedience. I don't know how that all translates into things, but it translates into things in heaven and in some cases here. But we know this, the salvation is completely a gift. There is nothing you can do, and Jesus never comes to you and says, because you have achieved these certain things, you are now worthy to be saved. What would those things even be? For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourself, it is the gift of God. 1 Peter 1, 18 through 21, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, he indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you who through him believe in God and raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Just to trust his cleansing blood. Just to trust it. John 1, 12 and 13. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God to those who believe in his name. Romans 8, 38 and 39, for I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. What can separate us? Nothing. Nothing. Hebrews 7, 23 through 25. Also, there were many priests because they were prevented by death from continuing, but he, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. Therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. I love that word, uttermost. You guys, most of you have been a while. You know I love that word, uttermost. He is able to save to the uttermost those who come to him by faith those who trust in Jesus, who trust in Jesus, will we take him at his word? Because there's a whole bunch of them. And I know in a number of those scriptures, I've, I've discussed it with some people who come from uh, even cult backgrounds, and they have all kinds of ways to try to explain those scriptures away, try to work it around to where somehow it's about us and not him and all that kind of stuff. But if you just read it for what it says and take him at his word, it's actually obvious. It's like I say, there's always those people that are go, going to go, you know, there's a lot of different interpretations for that. <laughs> there's a lot of different interpretations for all kinds of stuff, but <laughs> some of them are clearly wrong. And the, the, the interpretation here is obvious, that you're saved by grace and not of yourself so that no man can boast. It's just right there. We have no place to boast. I was talking about that in that song there goes on with the next verse and says, yes, tis sweet to trust in Jesus just from sin and self to cease, just from Jesus simply taking life and rest and joy and peace. You will notice that the lady who wrote this song in that video, she didn't have the best of circumstances going on in her life. Well, notice that. Living hand to mouth, trying to figure out how they're going to survive. Lost someone they loved dearly. Not the greatest circumstance, and yet he write, she writes this song. And so you ask, was she being disingenuous? You know, how could Paul have been so, you know, positive in that situation? Why wasn't he going, why wasn't he or, or the lady that wrote the song, why weren't they sitting there going, oh, God, what happened to you? You know, this is not supposed to happen. I believe in you. 
Everything in my life is supposed to go great. All my problems are supposed to be solved. Why didn't they do that? Because they had their mind and their eyes on the kingdom of God and not on this earth. They weren't putting their hope anywhere other than Jesus. Do you think Paul put his hope in Nero? You know, he's a pretty smart guy. Maybe I can convince him, you know. Mm. You know, I'll go in there and talk fast, and I'll get him, I'll get him, I'll, I'll cover it. You know, I'll go in there with a story, a sad story about everything that happened in my family and everything else, and then maybe he'll feel sorry for me. I, no, his hope is not in any of that. I don't think he was sitting there thinking, okay, God, this would be great if you just had him assassinated and they put somebody better in there. Mm, yeah. <laughs> Uh, that, wouldn't, that is goalie. But you know what? A human being might sit there and think that. It wasn't really unusual for Roman emperors to get assassinated. So you might be sitting there, put your hope in that. You know, I'm putting my hope in the fact that this person might get assassinated and my guy might get in. <laughs> Some of you guys know when I'm making uh, you know, references to stuff. Um, but, uh, and they go, okay, so here it is. And this is going to save us. No, I don't think Paul was doing that. I think Paul was going, I trust in Jesus. I think Luis wrote the song. I think she was saying, I trust in Jesus. I don't think she was being disingenuous. I think she was saying, you know what? A pie and some food showed up on my porch. That seems like a pretty small gesture, doesn't it? Not when you're there. Yeah, that's not a small gesture when you're there. To us, it might seem like a small gesture because a pie is a bonus. To them, they're trying to survive. And they trusted in Jesus to provide. You know, I remember the days when Michelle and I had next to nothing, and we really did trust in Jesus, and he always came through, and it was so glorious to see that, just day after day after day, miracle after miracle after miracle. Now I've got options and solutions. It's more challenging. It's more challenging, you know. Um, it, It makes it tougher. It is. So what happened to these guys? I'm sure that Luis and her daughter are sitting there praying and going, God, what do you want us to do? And they end up being missionaries. And God brings the glory. Why? Because they trusted in Jesus and not something else. John 14, 25 through 27 says, These things I have spoken to you while being present with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. Not as the world gives do I give you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. But look what he says. Not as the world gives. Not peace as the world gives. My peace I give to you. What kind of peace? The peace that passes understanding. And you know what that literally means? It means the peace that makes no sense. They're in these circumstances. You look at Paul in that situation, he has peace. You look at at Luis and she has peace. And many, many, many other people throughout history and they're in horrible circumstances and yet they have peace. Why do they have peace? And you look at them. I mean, there's been a lot of people, guys, even though I know this is true, And I have been through some very difficult circumstances in my life, That circumstances that if I hadn't been going through them, I would have said, I could never survive that. I survived it because of Jesus. But I look at other people going through some circumstances, I think, man, I couldn't do that. I'd be crazy. I'd be locked up in a loony bin by then, you know? And yet I do believe if I wasn't it, the Lord would give me the grace to walk through that. And he does. He gives that grace Peace, not as the world gives, but as he gives. That next verse says, I'm so glad I learned to trust thee. Precious Jesus, save your friend. And I know that thou art with me and wilt be with me to the end. Hebrews 13, 5 and 6. Keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have, for he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you, So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Now, I want to talk about that for a bit because there's some stuff that just jumped out at me. It's one of those verses I've read many times. And, of course, it's great. I'll never leave you or forsake you. That's wonderful, wonderful scripture. Notice it starts out with keep your life free from the love of money. See, because I used to read this scripture, it says, the Lord is my helper, I will not fear, what can man do to me? And I used to go, you know, man can do a lot. (laughs) Man can do a lot to me. They can chop my head off, they can 
torture me. They can boil me in oil. They can, you know, do all kinds of terrible things. So I'm going, what does he mean, what can man do to me? Especially when they understand persecution and all the stuff that's going on right around them. They, I mean, I'm thinking, you know, man can actually do a lot of horrible things. Man does a lot of horrible things. And so I was reading this and I thought, you know, the key is right back there in the beginning. Keep your life from the love of money. Because imagine this for a moment. Paul's in there. Paul's saying the things he said in Ephesians. He's going through that. What could man really do to Paul? He didn't, first of all, he didn't have anything for them to take away. He just trusted the Lord day by day. Secondly, he's going, hey, if I die, I win. If I, if I live, I win, you know. So the reason that he could say, what can man do to me, is because the world, the earth, had no hold on him. There was no hold on him. There was nothing there. I would, I would submit that many people in our time are more afraid of losing their stuff than they are of losing their life. <laughs> that's the thing that's in their head most days. And when that happens, you know, there, there are physical things that man can take away from me. They can. I know we go, we'll fight, but put all my stuff in my house and they can send a cruise missile in there and boom, you know. So stuff can be disappear in a hurry. But if I am not putting my hope or my joy or my security in those things, what can man do to me? If I say to live is Christ and to die is gain, and I really believe that, what can man do to me? If I think that if I trust, if I know that, if I trust in Jesus, no matter what circumstance I'm in, he can use it for his glory, what can man do to me? So I would ask, when we, when we ask ourselves, are we really trusting in Jesus? Is I would ask you, what are you very afraid of losing? What are you very afraid of losing? Now, I'm not saying you should just want to lose everything. <laughs> I'm just saying that what is it that you're really afraid of losing that you say, you know what, man, I, I don't know if that comes down. Um, you know, I might have to compromise a bit. What is it that we're afraid of losing? Because if anything is more important than Christ being glorified, it simply has become an idol in our lives. Anything. And folks, the Lord's working on me. I, I can see a few idols in my life. I can see these things that I go, ooh, well, that happens. Oh, you know, man. What if those were not the things that owned us? What if the only thing that ultimately, no, I shouldn't say the only thing, but the thing that ultimately matters above all else is simply that Christ is glorified through my life, through my death, through great blessing or great suffering, and sometimes suffering's a blessing. What if the, my 100% goal is that Jesus is glorified? Now, if I'm there, what can man do to me? Honestly, it's freedom. It's freedom. And maybe Gordon Lightfoot was right when he said freedom's just another word for nothing left to lose. <laughs> there is certainly some truth in that, okay? Because as you get stuff, when we didn't have stuff, when we didn't have stuff, when Michelle and I didn't have stuff, and we were just trusting in the Lord again, we saw his glory all the time, and, uh, and we weren't afraid to lose. And said, so what were we going to lose, you know? In 08, when things were crashing down around here and we had a lot of very desperate people losing their houses and cars and everything else, and we're going to see that again not too distant future, um, you know, all that was going on. People were panicking and freaking out. And you know why they were panicking and freaking out? Because they were losing their stuff. But I've shared with you many times that before that, I would walk around the chapel here after a service, listen to people talk, get in some conversations, and everybody was talking about what they were going to buy or what they were going to build or where they were going to go on vacation. And after everything crashed, you know what people were talking about? Jesus. They were talking about Jesus. He could walk around the room and get in conversations about Jesus in the Bible, not, not what you were going to build, where you were going to buy, or where you were going to go on vacation. They talked about Jesus. You know that this place, I had to turn out the lights at like 3 o'clock on Sunday afternoons just to get rid of people. Because they just stay here because there wasn't all that other stuff going on. 
They didn't have any money to go do all that other stuff, right? It was an interesting time. But it doesn't take long for us to begin to cling to the things of this world again, to keep your life free from the love of money. Understand when you see money in Scripture, it doesn't just mean some kind of currency. Generally, it's a reference to selfish gain. A reference to selfish gain. Riches did not just mean money. It could be all kinds of things. And all of a sudden, we don't own those things. They end up owning us. When we know they own us is when we're terrified of losing them. That's when we know. See, I'm a guy that I can enjoy stuff. I, I enjoy stuff. It's fun. But you know what? I know this in my heart. If it all went away tomorrow for some reason, I'm fine. I'm fine. He is with us to the end. I know that thou art with me and wilt be with me to the end. He will never leave us or forsake us. So what can man do? Man can do a lot if your hope and security are in this world. Man can do a lot. But if your hope and security are not in this world, what can man do to you? For those whose eyes are fixed on the Lord and his kingdom, will we take him at his word? How can anybody say no and still claim to trust in Jesus? Don't explain the things of the word away. Read it and just go, yeah, it's true. I have an inheritance kept for me in heaven through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ in my place, no matter what happens here, I win. No matter what happens, because he has already won. That battle is already won. And through Christ Jesus, I have eternal life, and I know this. I don't stand before you now and go, you know what? I sure hope I make it, you know? It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. That, la that chorus... Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I proved him o'er and o'er. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. Surely there are some of you in this room today that can say how I proved him over and over, not that God needed to be proved. He has proved himself. But through life, through all the stuff, you see, I know we come by faith. I know the only way to come to Jesus is by faith. And, but I want to tell you something about after having walked with him for like 40 years, you know, he walks with me and talks with me and tells me I am his own. He does. And the thing is, for 40 some years now, Jesus has been walking by my side. And so honestly, as I stand before you today, I can't say it takes a lot of faith for me to believe in Jesus. It really doesn't at this point. I mean, it's, it's hard to even call it faith because it's like saying, I believe my wife is here. I believe my wife is here because she's right. Well, I think she's still here. Um, I'm assuming unless the kids ran her off, but I could sit there and I could go, I know Steve and Sue are here. I believe that they're here. But as sure, sure as I know that they're sitting right there, I know that Jesus is real because I've been walking with him for 40 some years. How I proved him over and over. So somebody says, well, Jesus just doesn't exist. I mean, I don't, in my mind, I'm not going... Oh, what if they're right? You know? Wow, this had been a rough 40-some years. I could have been really rich. Whatever. No, I don't do that. Because there is no question in my mind that Jesus is, exists, that he died, he rose again, that he, he rose from the tomb, he was resurrected, he died in my place, that I have forgiveness of sin through him, and that I will be with him in heaven because he said, I go to prepare a place for you that where I am you might be also. I believe that. And so if somebody says, ah, your Jesus isn't real, I don't get, I'm just kind of like, you know, try to talk him in, you know, talk about the Lord, pray for his soul, but still, I'm going to go, it doesn't make me go, oh, whoa. Maybe a bunch of people just talked me into this. No, because I have experienced walking with the Lord. I have heard his voice. I have had him, his comfort in times of great trial. I have endured things that I know in myself I could never have endured yes. if Jesus had not been with me. So there is no question in my mind. There's no, so at this point in life, even though I know we come to him by faith, it doesn't take what I would call faith to believe in Jesus or that I am saved through him. What is challenging is to walk by faith and not by sight. That is challenging day to day, to walk in that faith 
and not by my sight. Because we see everything, right? That's one of the big problems. We see everything. And if you spend much time on the internet and with your TV on, you see all kinds of stuff. And, and it's easy to trip and fall and want to be walking by sight. And when you walk by sight, you do trip and fall. And he said, walk by faith and not by sight. So there's the challenging part, even though I've proved him over and over. He's proved himself in my life. It is challenging to walk by faith. Still, I want grace to trust him more. Amen. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust you. How I've proved you over and over. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus. Oh, for grace to trust him more. See, guys, grace, a lot of times people think grace is this ambiguous statement that just is about forgiveness. Certainly, it is by his grace we are forgiven without any question. But grace extends well beyond that in Scripture. It extends to grace is the thing that empowers us to walk as we should walk through his Holy Spirit. By his grace, he has given us his Holy Spirit to teach us all things, as we saw earlier. And so we walk in the Spirit, as we talked about on Wednesday nights. If you walk in the Spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. That he wants us to walk in the Spirit because he has sent his Spirit to teach us all things by his grace. His grace is not only the salvation that we have the opportunity for. It is the grace that empowers us by his Holy Spirit to live as he would have us live in this life. And so I say, I trust you, Jesus. Oh, for grace to trust you more. It's like the scripture. I believe. Help me in my unbelief. Help me in my unbelief. It is by God's grace that we can come to him. It's by his grace we can walk with him, and it's by his grace we can overcome sin in our life. And it's by his grace that we will go to be with him one day. I trust in Jesus. Oh, for grace to trust him more. I hope that would be our heart's cry today. And to really ask ourselves, have we been trusting in Jesus? Have we been trusting in something else? Have we been when chasing after all kinds of things? And, and then to examine our lives and ask, what are you really afraid of losing? I share with you back in 08, right when everything was crashing, we didn't know what, where things were going to go. And, and uh, you know, I was looking out on a congregation of people, couldn't find anybody with a job. I thought, man, what a time, you know. This was one of the hardest hit areas in the whole country. And so here I was looking out on this, you know, 100 people with wondering how they were going to survive. And then, of course, I, I, of course, I shouldn't say of course because I shouldn't have done it, but you kind of trip me, start walking by sight. And so I started working it through in my mind because, again, as I tell you all the time, I'm a problem solver, and that sometimes is a problem in itself. <laughs> so I go, I said, okay, I started talking to Michelle, and I was just sitting there thinking, and, you know, we've worked a long time to build up things over there, even though it wasn't, you know, anything that, it looks like a wrecking yard, I understand, but still. I mean, worked that up. So I'm sitting there and I'm going, I'm going, okay, what are we going to do? And then I, I, I'm talking to Michelle about it and I said, I'm going, okay, oh, so here's what, if things go down and, you know, we're, uh, we're not able to, to keep this place, then, you know, we'll let that go. We'll come down here. We'll live in the church building so we can keep this stuff going. I'm trying to figure it all out by sight and by planning. And I'm going, okay, we could do this, we could do that. And I'm worried about it and I'm kind of stressing about it. And then one night, the Lord spoke to me. And I remember I turned to Michelle and I said, you know what? And here I'd been stressing about this stuff for weeks, just going, and it's hard when people you care about are crashing down too. And I had friends who were homeless and stuff going on. It was just nuts. And another friend that called me had a gun to his head. It was a crazy time. And so that's all pretty stressful. And I'm thinking, how am I going to solve all this stuff? And I just remember when the Lord spoke to me one night, we were just sitting there on the couch, and I turned to Michelle and I said, you know what? Worst that could happen is we lose everything we have. And it was just complete peace. I just went, yeah, who cares? We've been without nothing before, arguably the best time in our lives. Um, frankly, um, you know, if you look back, I don't think a lot of us want to admit that, but a lot of times as we have acquired our kingdom, things have not gotten happier, they've become more stressful. We want to be honest with ourselves, certainly true in our lives. I mean, there's a lot of good things, I thank the Lord and all that, but, but if we lost everything... 
hey, I trust in Jesus. I trust in Jesus. Do you trust in Jesus today? I know that yeah, that's, when, we, when we look at it, there is no one else to trust. Shouldn't trust in anyone else anyway, but there really are no options. That's just true. This is about Christ, and it's all about him. All about him. And so with that, it seems like we should sing the song. So, and uh, There's a a meme that went around for a little while it said, church is where we go to sing lies. And I don't think that's universally true, but there's a piece in it. There's a piece of it where you go, you know, somebody might be sitting there going, all to Jesus I surrender, all to him I freely give, you know, or worldly pleasures all forsaken, blah, 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 and it's not true in their life. And so in one sense, it's kind of a, um, a conviction that I have now to kind of think about what I'm singing. And you know, I've actually been in places in my life where we're singing a song and I'm out in a, in a congregation and maybe Heather's leading back before I started fooling around with the bass up there. Um, and uh, honestly didn't sing a line of a song from time to time because I just went, I'm not sure it's true in my life. I'm not sure. I'm not sure I can say worldly pleasure's all forsaken. I'm not sure. And I don't want to be singing lies. So I say all that to say we should think about the words. We should think about the words. Why don't we stand together and sing? I'm not going to stand because I'm on a stool. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus Just to take Him at His word Just to Jesus, 
how I trust him, how I proved him o'er and o'er. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. Oh, for grace to trust him more.